Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today, and welcome to our webinar, Industry Insights, the World of Fuel Tax. My name is Hannah Kroom. I'm the Online Marketing Manager at ComData. And on behalf of ComData, thank you for taking the time to attend today's event. Joining me in the studio today are hosts Bob Turnius, Vice President of National Accounts at ComData, and Matt Morris, Regulatory Compliance Specialist at ComData. Before we get going, a few quick housekeeping notes. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the discussion where you can feel free to ask questions to either of today's speakers. Because of the number of attendees we have joining us today, we'll take your questions online at any time throughout the discussion, but we'll save responses for the end of the discussion. To ask a question, click the orange arrow on the right side of your screen to open your control panel and select the question and answer tab. Type your question into the box and then hit send. Again, you may submit a question at any time during the presentation. Matt, if you're ready, I'd love to turn the discussion over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Hannah, and I want to welcome everyone to the world of fuel tax. We will try to cover quite a bit of information in the next 45 minutes. And as Hannah said, if you have any questions as we go forward, please type those into the question box on the right side of your screen. We will get to as many of those questions as possible at the end of the presentation. You should be able to see the agenda on your screen now. I'll give a brief overview of ComData and talk about some current regulatory trends. Bob Turnius and I will then speak about fuel tax and EOBR in the trucking industry. I will conclude with a short discussion on another tax item, the IRS 2290, or heavy vehicle use tax. And then we will move into the Q&A section. First, a little about ComData and how we create value for our customers. Many of you may be aware of, our, of ComData's focus on innovative payment solutions and data management. We assist companies with a wide variety of solutions, including fuel cards, expense management, payroll and settlement distribution, and even regulatory compliance services. Now, within our solutions, we focus on the three basic reasons that our customers, or even ComData, would spend a dollar. The reason you spend a dollar first is to decrease an expense. So in other words, you're maybe purchasing technology or a dispatch platform, looking to increase efficiency so to decrease uh, maybe operating expenses. Another reason is to increase revenue. Maybe you're hiring new people, uh, making investments in equipment or uh, a new property or a new building. And the last is to mitigate a risk. So this is you know, maybe paying somebody to do credit checks on, on customers for credit lines or maybe purchasing insurance on your equipment or on your business as a whole. So decreasing an expense, increasing revenue, or mitigating a risk. And these are the what we focus our attention on here at ComData. And within those, we want to help our customers save money, grow their business, and minimize the financial risks. Our goal is you know, if we help you, you know, as our customers become successful, then obviously we will be successful as well. And next I will show you how we create value within our regulatory compliance division specifically. There are a few of the items that will help us drive value for our customers. Now, obviously, the people at, the, at ComData are at the heart of everything we do. As a company, we have over 40 years of experience in the transportation industry. For that 40 years, we've always had a customer-centric focus. This is evident in our designated team approach. As many of you may already know, you have a team of cross-functional associates who are able to assist you with your account, whether that's a fuel account, a ComData MasterCard account, fuel tax account, whatever it may be. And typically, you'll have an inside and outside sales representative as well as a client administrator or customer relations representative who is assigned to your account that assists you in using the products the most efficient way possible. Now, our people also focus on a couple of items internally. First is product innovation. We work to customize our programs to each company's need with a focus on integration of technology to help reduce costs and eliminate redundancy. As an example of the product innovation, you can see on the second bullet point down, 
is the NextGen Connection Permit Platform. We rolled this out a little over a year ago. It's a platform that streamlines the temporary permit ordering process and gives customers unmatched access to state permit information. Now, shifting to the right side of the screen, we take a look at the processes we focus on. So our goal is to help customers improve all aspects of compliance in both U.S. and Canadian markets. We accomplish this by providing many different solutions under one umbrella. So next we'll take a look at the regulatory solutions that we're speaking about. So this, this slide shows a quick snapshot of the solutions that we offer. We've already mentioned the permits through our NextGen platform. And working hand in hand with our permitting service is our pilot car service, which is next on the right hand side. In the near future, our platform for permitting and pilot cars will be combined so that NextGen will be a true one-stop shop for temporary permits as well, as, as well as pilot cars when they're needed. We also work with carriers on safety services, including log auditing, driver inspections, and even driver qualification files. We can also help you track CSA compliance and provide benchmarks for companies of a similar size. Within licensing, we offer assistance for IRP and non-IRP related vehicles. We like to say from cradle to grave. Uh, we can assist with anything from title work to removing a vehicle or even a trailer uh, from service. So beginning to end of the vehicle life cycle. And then last is fuel tax. And we'll spend much of our time discussing this today, so I'm going to skip over that quickly for now. The first thing I want to touch base on is some of the trends that are impacting regulatory compliance. First, we have to look at the economic factors driving regulatory decisions. As federal and state budgets and revenues have decreased, organizations and, and states and governments themselves have reduced the number of employees. Uh, we still have high unemployment rates in the U.S. Now, Kiplinger's 2011 forecast does not show a good outlook for the remainder of this year. Now, what this means for regulations and trucking specifically is that states are becoming more stringent in regulatory enforcement. To give an example, among our customers, we have seen an increase in the number of audits related to fuel tax and safety. We've also seen an increase in the amounts of assessments tied to those audits. So more people are being audited, and when the, if there is an assessment, we're seeing those assessments in much greater dollar, value, dollar values. Uh, and as you know, assessments are one of the ways that a state can raise additional funds, and so that's, that's what we are seeing. And, and we're also seeing that items that may have been overlooked a few years ago are more, more closely scrutinized today. It is important to note that regulations in general are meant to drive a certain type of behavior. And this is true with, with CSA. The FMCSA is trying to reduce the number of accidents and specifically fatalities for large trucks on the road. The seven basics are meant to usher in a new era of driver safety, even as the number of serious accidents and fatalities continues to decline. So if you take a look at it, CSA, hours of service regulations, assessments, all of these things are meant to drive safety conscious behavior. One thing is that ComData is committed to being at the forefront of safety and compliance regulations. As an example of this commitment, we are offering a new solution to test and treat sleep apnea for truck drivers. This has been a hot button, and there's even been some conferences dedicated specifically to sleep apnea. The ComData solution is powered by sleep access and includes a nationwide network of test and equipment providers. Uh, this, will help bring, this will help drivers to be healthier and thus safer, and also help bring cost out of the healthcare environment for most companies. For, as an example, for drivers who need to be treated for sleep apnea, the ROI on ComData's sleep solution, again powered by sleep access, is almost 400 percent in the first year. Uh, suffice it to say that there will be additional information coming out on this in the, in the coming weeks if you haven't seen information about it already. Uh, but most of our focus today will be fuel tax. For the introduction to fuel tax specifically, I will turn the presentation over to Bob Turnius. Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matt. 
let's take a high level look at fuel tax. And, and primarily there are two components, fuel and mileage, fuel and miles uh, consumed and traveled. So we're looking at diesel fuel where the carrier buys the diesel fuel. There's various tax rates from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, from province to province. But there are two, the, the second primary tax rate for fuel is from the federal government. And currently, that rate is 24.4 cents per gallon and seems like it raises itself up every year. What do the taxes, uh, what do they go for? They, they go into all types of uh, road construction and maintenance that the state jurisdiction does on the roads to support uh, the, tra the transportation industry. So how, how is the fuel tax governed? It's governed under an agreement called the International Fuel Tax Agreement, or com what is commonly known and referred to as IFTA. And in order to be in that uh, agreement, the carrier has to cross state lines or be intrastate, not interstate, but intrastate. The tractor that uh, is under the uh, agreement has to have two axles and a GVW gross vehicle weight of greater than 26,000 pounds or be a three plus axle regardless of weight and or used in combination when the weight is in greater uh, pounds than 26,000 again. Let's take a, a look at a concept that, that we like to use called burn versus buy. And in fuel tax, it's not as important where you purchase the fuel or buy the fuel, where the tax liabilities are incurred is a compilation of where you actually consume or burn the fuel. So again, the emphasis should be on where you actually are, are generating the miles, not where you're actually purchasing the fuel. So the carrier, the trucking company, you must file your if the return on a quarterly basis. And in that return, you report the miles driven, and then you report the miles purchased and consumed by state. That gives you your, your total miles and your total fuel purchase gives you an, a fleet MPG. And if the carrier, if you underpurchase in a state, then there's going to be a tax due. Conversely, if you overpurchase in a particular state, a refund will be available. This next slide gives an example of tax due versus refunding. And the first thing I'd like to point out is the second column total miles, and then you look at the um, fourth column tax, or excuse me, the total gallons purchased, and you divide that, that gives you your fleet MPG. And in the second uh, point to bring out here, you can see in this illustration where the tax on the gallons consumed are weighed against the pump tax paid to get a net tax due or a refund. Now, in, in both cases here, in Indiana and in Illinois, the overpurchased gallons were in a low state, a low tax state, Indiana, and they were consumed in a high tax state, Illinois. So even though in the last column you see an overpurchase of 2,076 gallons, there is still a, a net tax due of $3,531.94. So it, it, again, it's not, import, it's not as important where you purchase the fuel, it's where you burn or consume the fuel. Okay? There's another type of tax that, that we also want to address in addition to fuel tax and IFTA, uh, the IFTA agreement. Mileage taxes. Uh, a couple of things about mileage taxes, there are currently four states, New York, Oregon, New Mexico, and Kentucky, that have additional tax in, in, in addition to the if the return. So you have different filing requirements for each jurisdiction. And in IFTA, and we'll talk about audits a little bit later, but in IFTA, your base state will come in and conduct an audit and it will suffice for all members in, in the IFTA agreement. Rarely will a member come in and contest a, a, a state or jurisdiction's audit. Normally it's, it's accepted as filed. So that's the difference in the state. You might have an IFTA audit going on and then New York may give you a call and want to come in and, and audit the mileage side. 
and Tom Data's system has the ability to the fuel tax miles that we generate also go into and the completion of the mileage tax returns. So really there's two different types of taxes here, the mileage tax and the IFTA fuel tax. So with that, I'm going to send this back to Matt and we're going to talk, he's going to talk a little bit about record keeping requirements of IFTA. Matt? Thanks, Bob. Yeah, Bob has explained how fuel tax works and how it's calculated. But what I want to do is step back for a moment and determine how we get the information we need for fuel tax, um, we being the carriers or and or com data. So where does that information come from? What do we need to keep? What does it need to have on it? Uh, so this slide shows the record keeping requirements for IFTA. On the left column, you will see the distance record information. So whether you use an EOBR, which we'll talk about in more detail, uh, paper trip report, dispatch data, or any combination of the before mentioned items, you must have source documentation for mileage. And basically you have to have proof of where you've driven. So you can see the items that are required on the left column, such as the start and end date of a trip, along with the origin, beginning and ending odometer, total trip miles, etc. In the middle column, we discuss the fuel records that must be kept. So that suffices for the distance portion. On the fuel side, it is important for every carrier to keep accurate fuel records. When you buy fuel at the pump, you're paying the fuel tax. It's already added into the price per gallon. If you do not have proof that you purchased the fuel, then you can't use the fuel tax that you paid at the pump as a credit to toward your total fuel tax liability. Uh, so basically you're wasting money if you're not keeping records of the fuel that is purchased on the road. So you can see the fuel re record requirements such as the date of the purchase, number of gallons, type of fuel. Uh, there are sometimes different tax rates for different types of fuel, etc. Uh, at the far right, bulk fuel is another consideration. If you purchase fuel in bulk, you typically pay taxes on all 2,000 or 5,000 gallons at the time of purchase, but you must keep records of where that fuel goes, both for IFTA and non-IFTA vehicles, so that want to know where every gallon of fuel that came out of that tank went. Uh, and again, you can see the items that you need there, date of withdrawal, number of gallons, fuel type, unit number. Uh, and, and now that and what I want to go with this is now that we've taken uh, and know the information we need, know the data points we need, you know, the question is how do we get there? What documents get us there? What, what's acceptable for the DOT? We start looking at source documents. Um, and, and since we've been talking about fuel, let's start with the right side of this slide, which is fuel purchases. For fuel purchases, electronic records or listings from third-party fuel card companies are acceptable source documents. Our, our ComData customers have the source records that they need for fuel documentation. If a company uses another fuel card, a credit card, or cash at a retail fuel location, uh, it is a good idea to keep the receipt. Some cards may not have the detail needed to act as a source document for fuel tax purposes. In other words, it may be a piece of information missing or it may be summarized uh, instead of having all of the detail broken out. So, But having the original receipt on hand will ensure that you have all the pertinent information. For bulk fuel, there are a couple of options to track the fuel that is being pumped out of the tank. Uh, the first may be a card reader. ComData has a product called a ComSite, which some of you may be familiar with. It is a card reader that can be installed at a terminal pump. A driver would swipe his or her card to get fuel, and the transaction will show up with the rest of the fuel purchased for the month in the monthly reports. Obviously, the one difference being we're not going to charge a company for the fuel because they've already purchased it before they put it in the tank but it is an easy way to track and manage bulk fuel. Uh, there are also similar solutions out there, such as key locks, uh, additional types of card locks, or there are some companies today that are using something as simple as a spreadsheet or a handwritten log uh, to log all of the gallons that come out of that bulk tank. On the mileage side, take a shift there, we have a few different things. We have the EOBR, or Electronic Onboard Recording Device, it's a device that sits in the cab and can give an electronic breadcrumb trail for distance. So it's like a GPS type system that's going to tell you where you've, uh, where you've been. 
We have paper trip reports, which that is where a driver is manually writing the mileage, origin, destination, route of travel, state lines, etc. Typically on a piece of paper or maybe an envelope, I'm keeping the receipts inside that envelope, but it's a manual process. And then on the mileage side, some people will will use dispatch data. Uh, so for those of you who use dispatch data, the system gives you an origin and destination and you know may have routing software attached that will give you the practical route that's the, typically the shortest distance between the two points. It may not always be the drive, the, or excuse me, it may not always be the route the driver took. So that's why I've also included odometer normalization and have that listed. I'll also notice I have a uh, odometer normalization listed under the EOBR system. The reason is, is since the dispatch and or the EOBR are not 100% accurate all of the time, it is also important and pertinent to have odometer readings in your mileage calculations. Uh, Com data system, we can do with something called normalization where we normalize everything back to your odometer readings, even if you're using dispatch or an EOBR system. Uh, and that way, every mile is accounted for from an odometer standpoint. What I'd like to do at this time is find out how our audience members are tracking mileage today. So you should see a poll question here shortly on your screen. And please select the answer that best fits your company. Uh, I realize some of you may use multiple sources, so pick the one that you use more often. In other words, if you have most of your vehicles with an EOBR and a few of them that do paper, you know, go with the EOBR. Also, if you select other, you can type uh, how you calculate mileage in the questions box on the right-hand side. I'm going to give you a few seconds here to get the results. All right, let's take a look at the results. What we're seeing now is that, uh, wow, about 41% of you, actually it's tied 41%, paper-based and EOBR, which is interesting. Uh, we've seen quite a few here is moving towards the EOBR, but it's interesting to me that, that of the companies on this call, we have a, a tie there between the two. Uh, interesting. One thing we'll take a look at now after we looking at the poll questions, we'll take a look at ComData specific fuel tax solution. I'm uh, just going to spend a short time on this and just let you know some of the items that are out there and available. ComData's fuel tax solution is a web-based solution, and we have both full service and self-service options. Now, what I mean by full service and self-service is that it's really at the comfort level of a company and, and how you would like to proceed with a uh, solution. For instance, on the full service, we can integrate uh, your EOBR data. We can integrate paper-based trip reports and all fuel purchases into our web-based platform. And on the full service side, ComData will handle all the calculations, manage most of the gaps, and handle really most any of the issues uh, for you on your behalf. On the self-service side, we will still do the same integration. We will bring everything into the same website, uh, but it's something where you will then, as a customer, log in and manage most of the information yourself. So we provide the platform and the technology, and then it will be something that you manage on a, a daily or weekly or even monthly basis. Our solution is also exception-based. What I mean by exception-based is that we calculate an MPG for every vehicle each month that's in your fleet. What we will do is work with you on a customized solution where we're going to define the parameters for your vehicles. Uh, we'll set a minimum and a maximum MPG for your truck uh, or vehicle. We will pull all the information, both mileage and fuel information, and calculate an MPG for that vehicle. If it falls outside of those parameters, high or low, then we will flag it for further follow-up. And there's some additional flaggings as well. Uh, you know, maybe if we haven't received, a, if you're using an EOBR and we haven't received a ping uh, in a specified time period, that'd be something additional that we would flag and so forth. Once we have all the information combined and summarized, uh, we then make them available to you via reports. We have the IFTA report, 
which can be generated for you in addition to the four mileage tax states, so your New York, New Mexico, Oregon, and Kentucky. Uh, and in addition to those, we have 35 other management reports that you can use. Anything from uh, something such as a owner-operator chargeback report, where you can run a mini IFTA for your owner-operators or for each one individually uh, to provide back to them, to reports that will show you out-of-route miles. Uh, if we get certain pieces of information, we can not only tell you where the driver uh, should have gone, but where he did go and how many additional miles that may have cost you by taking a different route. Uh, it becomes a great tool for helping to reduce costs within an organization. The last thing I'll mention is that we do have multiple refund types. What I'll mention with this is the most common one is refrigerated refunds, or reefer refunds as they're commonly known. For companies that have refrigerated trailers, you usually have to, they will have a tank, a diesel tank on the trailer that will take diesel that powers the motor to cool the trailer. Uh, since that uh, fuel is not used to power the vehicle down the road, you can file for uh, return on all that tax you paid at the pump. So since you're paying a fuel tax on each gallon as you purchase it, you can file for a refund since you're not using that to power the vehicle down the road. Uh, it can be some substantial dollar amounts, especially when you talk about a large fleet with quite a few different reefer tractors out there, reefer trailers out there. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Bob Ternius, and he's going to speak to us a little bit more on the electronic onboard recorders, or EOBRs. Bob? Thank you, Matt. So the slide we're looking at now uh, is basically uh, what an EOBR onboard uh, recording device is doing. There are two types of EOBRs. One, Fabolite, which is a, uh, an older system that was developed by the U.S. government primarily for military purposes. And then the second, more uh, current version is cellular or terrestrial based. And the, the primary reason, or, or let's step back into the 90s, um, a few of the characteristics of, of the initial EOBR, which was uh, a satellite base, um, number one, Qualcomm was, was a leader in, in the uh, development of this program, of the programs around what is called Global Positioning Satellites, or GPS. The, the fact is, back in the 90s, this technology was very expensive. And carriers um, were normally uh, taking hourly ping, what we call ping readings, which is a long lap reading of the truck at any given time. Uh, carriers were restricted to using hourly readings simply because of the cost involved in satellite transmission. The, uh, the primary uh, tools, the primary uses for that tool for the GPS was for location and communication. That really started the revolution uh, of the EOBRs uh, in the transportation world because now you can communicate to the cab and you always know where the tractor is. So your customer knows loads and things of that nature. So in the 2000s, uh, cellular-based technology came to play and it was much wider developed, uh, deployed. It was much cheaper than satellite-based and you could also uh, store data and forward it. Uh, another key component in the 2000s, the DOT, what they did was decide um, that they could use the long lap readings, the ping readings, in the process of safety to make things more safe for the traveling public. So what we began to see in the 2000s were paper logs being uh, done away with and onboard devices using electronic logs, driver logs. And uh, the EOBR also began to be utilized in the fuel tax application, which we're going to talk about, which we have been talking about, and will continue throughout this presentation. Finally, in 2010, ComData projects that one half to one third of all trucks over the road have some form of an EOBR installed. And further, about 70% of the fleet of 100 trucks or more had EOBRs installed. So back in the 2000s, early 2000s, industry was reluctant to embrace uh, the EOBR. But now with the driver or with the paperless log, the fuel tax application, and the 
pending uh, mandate, we think, of the EOBRs to the trucking industry by the DOT, the FMCSA, carriers are beginning to embrace the EOBR. So it's really not, you know, Big Brother watching over you now. It's more of a, a, a retention tool for their drivers. So that's a, a tremendous shift from the two, from where we're at today, 2010, 2011, from the beginning in uh, 1990. We mentioned the word in term ping, but, but let's talk about that a little bit a little bit more in detail. The first thing that, that is important in utilization, utilization of the ping is the length of the trip. The longer the, the trip, and I'm talking about an average trip, the, the less pings are required to route the truck. So if you've got a, a carrier that has an average length of haul of say 300 miles or more, then normally an hourly ping is sufficient. Now, uh, an exception there would be if the carrier is concentrated in the Northeast, then you can cross into three or four states within a 30-minute period, and that would um, skew the actual ping readings that we receive and the mileage we generate as a result of those ping readings. And finally, LTL carriers, local distribution companies, and short-haul carriers, 15-minute pings we recommend highly. Again, for the same reason, you can go in and out of the state. You might go just over one border and come back in, and in an hour, you might miss that ping. You might, the truck may not be pinged within the hour, so we highly recommend moving from an hour to 15-minute intervals for the local and short-haul carrier. The system that ComData has developed and utilizes, we also look um, at empty and loaded, empty and ready status messages. That generates pings. We also look at loaded and departing status messages. And again, we emphasize the more we get ping readings, the better the trip is. The better the route, the better the audit support is. Okay. We've also went ahead and, and, and compiled some information and, and ran uh, what we call a ping frequency test. There were two sets of data tested, and the average trip length was approximately 300 miles. And the key point to this graph is the, the mean difference between an EOBR routing and odometer reading when you utilized an hourly ping reading was 0.72%. When you drop that hour to every 30 minutes, we, we reduced our error factor by 0.14%, and which is a tremendous savings and efficiency add uh, to, the, to the job we're doing for our customers. And a, and a final thing on, on the overall concept of fuel tax, consistency is critical. Um, if, if you're consistent in your reporting or providing of data to com data and, and et cetera, then you've paid for, you, you've been taxed on your gallons, you've accounted for all of your miles, there may be a, a slight difference in a jurisdiction state to state type scenario, but you've paid everything. so there will be a minimum uh, tax due in, in the, um, in the uh, if the audit because you're consistent in what you're doing, your methodology. Com data is equally consistent, and therefore uh, auditors are very comfortable with the data we provide to them on behalf of our customer base. I think at this, at this moment, let's take a second and, and, and do another quick poll of the audience. Um, like the first question, uh, there, there will be multiple choices here. And the question we want to pose is, um, how, do, how do you use or do you use odometer data in, in your uh, current fuel tax filing process? Answers, uh, the radio is yes, no, and don't know. So let's take a moment, and if you would, please uh, complete that poll. And uh, that will give us some good information. We feel at ComData that the odometer is critical in the process. And it's also important to note that IFTA, in the IFTA rules and regulations, there is a requirement that the odometer data, beginning and ending of a trip, is captured. So I know back in the 90s and even the early 2000s, most carriers did not provide odometer data for one reason or another. 
you know, one one reason primarily in the 90s was the cost. So now it, it, it's much more uh, focused, it's put on that. And the audience, 62% uh, have chosen the fact that they do provide odometer data in their fuel tax process, and 24 no. So that's a good percentage. That's actually more than what I thought. Um, the 62 percent, I thought that would be a little bit lower than that. So that's good that uh, our audience is, is using odometer data in their fuel tax processing. Okay, let's finally, um, on the next slide, let's look at risk. And, and this is kind of the genesis of where we started in the 90s again versus where we're at today. The type of mileage, the paper trip report, there is an error factor that, that's assigned to that type of an operation anywhere from 0 to 20 percent. In ComData's proprietary methodology and the systems that we've developed, the next to the last grouping, the EOBR data with gap fill or trip matching technology, you can see the, the tremendous reduction down to 0.5 to 1 percent error factor when utilizing the EOBR data with gap fill or trip matching. And ComData is the only fuel tax processor that has this technology built into the system. So again, a high level view, but, and, and then again, the last one is utilization of the odometers. The percentage difference is less, but yet still it's an improvement. So from zero to 0.5 percent. So that's some, some very strong um, error factor data and information. Paper is slowly being removed and technology through EOBRs are, are coming into play. Okay, let's look at uh, what ComData recommends for uh, the EOBR audits. There's two phases. The first phase you have to, we really encourage carriers to have a general understanding of our process and their process. By that I mean you, you need to understand how data flows and what data edit steps are taken on, on each trip. And ComData, we talked earlier about exception-based reporting, and, and that's what we speak to is, uh, excuse me, data and edit steps taken by ComData to ensure that that trip is accurate. And you also need to verify your gap fill and steps taken. In full service, ComData does that. In the self-service application, the customer does that. So that's an, that's an option there in the two systems. In phase two, we recommend a sample audit. If you're a 50-truck fleet, we would recommend perhaps five trucks and, and look at that and, and really dig into the system that's being applied and ensure that that system is being applied across the board consistently on all your tractors. And if you find a problem, what we recommend is expanding the sample and develop error factors. That, with that process and that methodology, you know where your problem, where your exposure and risk are at, and you can focus in on correction of the MPG, making sure that all miles and all fuel are being reported accurately. So with that, I'm going to send it back to Matt, and he's going to look at yet another tax, the heavy vehicle use tax for 2290. Very good. Thanks again, Bob. And again, we are going to take a look at the heavy vehicle use tax. And for those of you who are familiar with this, uh, bear with me for a second, but you know, just want to remind the others and everyone on the call that heavy vehicle use tax and fuel tax are separate items. Uh, don't necessarily have to go together. In other words, if you have a truck that has an IFTA sticker, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have uh, or have to file for your heavy vehicle use tax or have to pay that. Uh, but it is a key consideration. There's a few things I want to cover with respect to the heavy vehicle use tax. And you know, you'll hear me refer to it at times as the 2290 as well. It's actually IRS form 2290 is the form you fill out to submit to the IRS to pay for the heavy vehicle use tax. So uh, at times I will use the terms interchangeably. We'll look at a few just key aspects of the 2290. First of all, who has to file? Uh, a 2290 must be filed by anybody with a truck or tractor that weighs 55,000 pounds or more. This is true of any individual 
or any type of organization, profit or nonprofit, uh, charitable organization. It's also true of you know, private or for hire farmers. It doesn't necessarily matter if it's a truck that weighs 55,000 pounds or more and is going to be operated on public roads. Uh, the Form 2290 does need to be filed and the heavy vehicle use tax needs to be filed. Again, what is it? It's a tax paid to the IRS for the upcoming year of service. Uh, this is a tax that is subject to audit. Uh, so the IRS can audit you to, to determine if you've paid, uh, first, if you've paid the tax, and second, if you've paid the correct amount based on your fleet. And again, when? Since it starts and it's for the upcoming year of service, uh, the tax period for the 2290 is July 1st to June 30th. Um, July 1st obviously being right around the corner. An annual renewal for your entire fleet is late if it's not submitted by August 31st. That includes two pieces. That includes not only uh, filing the 2290 but paying the heavy vehicle use tax. I have to have both parts of that complete by August 31st uh, to not be considered late. The other th item is the one month grace period from a date a truck is put into service. This is something that maybe occurs throughout the year. So let's say as an example maybe you, you have a new truck and you put it into service on January 15th. Uh, you actually have until February 28th so you have a grace period until the end of the next month to file and submit your supplemental 2290 uh, to pay the rest of the year's tax for that vehicle obviously since it's only going to be there for part of the year. Now conversely, if you have a vehicle that you're taking out of service at some point during the year, you can file to get a credit on your 2290. Uh, because again, it's paid in advance, so you've already paid the money in, but you can recover part of it if you're taking that vehicle out of service, if you've sold it, uh, or what have you. And again, many of you may be familiar with this too, especially if you're Joining the call, and uh, you are involved with a fleet that has 25 or more trucks. Uh, you've probably been filing electronically for a couple of years now, uh, both the supplements and the uh, and the annual 2290 filing. Uh, so, anything 25 plus, they'd like you to file electronically. And then, when you pay the IRS, you actually have to pay them directly. You can pay them in one of two ways. You can pay them through EFTPS which is something set up directly through the IRS, or you can set up uh, an ACH to be generated and sent to the IRS. After you've submitted the form online, in addition to paying the IRS, you actually get sent a watermarked Schedule 1 via email. The Schedule 1 is basically your receipt that says you did pay your 2290. And the big question is why? Okay, why do we have the, the 2290? Again, it's a Remember, it's only for 55,000 pounds and over. Uh, you know, so the idea is that the trucks and vehicles that weigh that much or more are doing additional damage to the roads, so the revenue is actually distributed back to the states for highway work for that purpose. Uh, in addition, why you, know, why you have to file is most states now require you to show proof of your 2290 payment before they will renew your tags for the year, your IRP plates for the year. Now, there's been a couple of key considerations with respect to the 2290 uh, here recently. One is that some of you may be aware the 2290 tax or the heavy vehicle use tax expires on September 30th of this year. In other words, Congress hasn't renewed it past that point. Uh, and so right now the IRS is determining what the best way to proceed is. Um, for, for all purposes, the, the tax will likely, I mean, very likely be renewed. It's not something I don't think is going to go away. It's just a matter of Congress having to act to uh, extend that tax. And so there's been a couple of discussions. One is that the IRS may put out a form uh, here in the coming weeks or two. It's a three-month form that will cover the period from July 1st to September 30th. Um, there's been some talk about that. And then if they, if and and or when they extend the tax, then you would have to file an additional 2290 for the remaining nine months until next June 30th. Uh, there's been some talk about maybe the IRS holding off and waiting to see if Congress passes it relatively soon. Uh, and so then they'll just do the normal yearly form. Uh, but we don't know yet exactly what's going to happen with that, so stay tuned. 
one key point is for you, those of you that have uh, IRP renewals that occur in July, uh, July, August, or September. Uh, normally, you would have to show your Schedule 1 that says you've paid your 2290 before you can get your tag. Uh, the IRS has notified the states, and it is a rule that you can show your previous year's 2290 uh, proof of payment, your Schedule 1 from last year, to get your tags renewed for 2011-2012. And again, that will pertain if you your IRP renews in July, August, or September. So talking a little bit about the, the 2290, what it is, why we have it, where to file. Uh, the next question is how. You can file 2290 through ComData's website. Uh, this would be a self-service type module where you can actually go in and you can fill out the information and submit it directly through our website. We do offer full service on this as well, something that we can do for you if you choose. You can see the top there is the link to our website and it walks you through these these same three steps are the three steps that are on the on the web page. And one is the setup, you know, to set up your EFTPS number. I would recommend doing that as quickly as possible. It's a free service offered by the IRS but it does take up to two weeks to get a PIN number back from the IRS so that you can generate trans fund transfers that way to pay your taxes. Uh, it's not something you can wait until the last uh, couple of days and, and go try to file for your uh, EFTPS number and, and you won't get it back in time. You'll end up being late with that. So just remember to do that relatively quickly. The second piece is the download. You can actually download a template which is in a uh, Excel format directly from the website. It tells you exactly what each field is and, and the information that is needed for the 2290. And then the third part is filing the taxes. Our, uh, you can actually set up on our website with a username and a login. Uh, you can then upload the template that you downloaded in step two and filled out. You can upload that into our system and it will pull all of your vehicle information in, at which point you can then file your 2290 directly from our website. Again, that's the self-service. Uh, model. You can choose to do a full service model uh, if you want, and we can handle those types of, th I mean, this type of thing for you. And with that, I mean, again, if it's something you want to look at full service, something like fuel tax, or if you have questions regarding permitting or any of the other items that we've mentioned, licensing, uh, sleep apnea, any of those types of items, you can contact your uh, combat sales representative. If you have one, uh, either your inside representative or your outside representative, or you can call us at the number you see there. They have 1-800-COM-DATA. We'd be more than happy to help you out, uh, and we would love to talk to you and, and see if we have a solution that would fit your need. Matt and Bob, thank you so much for that great information. Um, we will now begin answering any questions that our audience has. Again, to ask a question, click the orange arrow on the right side of your screen to open your control panel and select the question and answer tab. Type your question into the box, hit send, we'll get it over on this end and um, try to answer as many questions as possible in the remaining few minutes. If we don't get to every single question today, um, Matt will be hosting a post-webinar discussion on LinkedIn where we'll be able to answer a few more questions and, um, and we'll, we'll definitely be able to at least answer every single question on an individual basis if not um, within the next couple of minutes. Um, we've gotten some great questions in. I want to start out with one for, for Bob. Um, Bob, have you found that the utilization of EOBRs has improved driver retention? Yes, uh, I think in the past six months to a year, the, the carriers that we work with have, have said, without almost without exception, that the acceptance of, of paperless electronic logs versus paper logs, um, it's, now, it's now commonplace. And where there was resistance maybe three years ago, again, I believe the industry and drivers in the industry believe that eventually this will be mandated. So it's kind of like, let's get used to it now because it's going to come anyway. Might as well get a head start on uh, implementation, training, and utilization of the system. Thanks, Bob. Um, this next one I'm going to pass over to Matt. Matt, what is the cost of filing electronically? Is it per truck or per fleet? This is a three-part question. Is there a minimum number of trucks needed to file electronically? 
All right, I'm going to try to see if we can take that piece by piece. Uh, I'm not sure if that's pertaining to 2290 or if it's talking to calculating the IFTA, uh, but I see a couple of questions I think came in on the IRS 2290 and the cost uh, in that scenario too. So I'll try to address all of it. First of all, the cost of uh, filing electronically, uh, there is a schedule of fees on the 2290 side. There's a schedule of fees directly on our website that will tell you before you submit anything or before you finalize the process of you know what, it, what the cost will be. It's based on the filing itself and based on the number of trucks you have. So uh, for instance, if it's uh, uh, 0 to 25 trucks, it, it's a specific price. Uh, or one, I guess it would be one to 25 trucks, and then so forth from there on the 2290 side. When we start talking about fuel tax, the way we charge for fuel tax is uh, based on the number of tractors. Uh, not only the number of tractors, but how we're getting the source documentation. For instance, if we're keeping track of paper uh, or manual DTRs or driver trip reports, where the drivers are filling it out and then you're sending those to us, um, what you can do is send those to us, and we will actually key those into the system and then scan the original copy in for you as well. So it's all available back to you via the web. But that is going to be a little bit more on a per truck basis than if we get all the information electronically. For instance, if you have a, a EOBR provider that's either providing you the the ping data and then you providing it to ComData, or we're getting it directly from the EOBR provider, uh, that becomes an electronic process. Same thing on the fuel side. If you're using a fuel card, uh, obviously we would love it to be a ComData fuel card, but if you're using any type of fuel card, we can work with that and import that electronic data into our system. Uh, the cost uh, would be a little bit more if you do it with maybe cash receipts or, or cash or just a plain receipt, which we will enter into the system, but there's an additional cost for that. Uh, but on the fuel tax side, it is a per truck per month uh, fee for, for fuel tax. And if you want specifics, you know, reach out to myself or Bob or your sales rep uh, after this call and we can get specific pricing for you based on the number of vehicles that you have and how you're uh, keeping the source document. Great. I'm going to throw this next one over to you, Bob. Um, one part of my fleet uses EOBR, others use paper. Um, what should I do if I use multiple sources of mileage record? Well, that's really not an issue. Um, in the startup with ComData, there's a client administrator that works with all setup in the process. So we would set up perhaps a fleet with the EOBRs, with the electronic uh, mileage uh, being provided, and then have another fleet set up that are, are doing the driver trip reports. But the key thing is, is we start on a month a month in beginning. You don't switch from one to another within the month. And two, more importantly, is we, we uh, account for all miles and all fuel. That's the main thing. So we can do it all the OBRs, all paper, or a combination thereof. We just need to identify those units so we can treat them respect, you know, accordingly. Thanks, Bob. Um, I'm actually going to take this next question. What does EOBR stand for? Um, I apologize if we didn't clarify this earlier. EOBR stands for Electronic Onboard Recorder or Recording System. Um, Matt, I'll let you take this next one. How do you file for reefer fuel refunds? That's a very good question. And it's something that, that uh, many carriers uh, may not be taking advantage of today, which is you know, basically leaving money on the table. Reefer fuel refund, how you could, there's actually a few different ways. Um, and I'll tell you this, you can actually file for a federal refund, which is done on your tax return. Uh, you can even go back in time and do some retro uh, fuel tax filings. But on the federal level, if you do a retro, retro uh, filing, which what it basically is akin to amending your uh, IRS tax return, which it, it is a a flag for an audit, you're more likely to be audited. So we don't recommend going back in time on the federal side, but going forward, you can file for those. Uh, it's directly on the tax forms. Uh, the same thing for states. States have a little bit uh, different rules. There are some states you can go back as far as three years and recover fuel tax 
paid uh, for reefer fuel. Uh, and again, it's just going to depend on the state as far as how that's done. But what you would have to do is keep each state has its own form, but you just have to keep a uh, file of what exact fuel you purchased that went into the reefer tanks versus went into the tractor. Uh, you'd have to complete the form that the state has and then mail that form off and the state will have to process that. Uh, it can be a substantial sum of money, but it is something that ComData works with too. So if it's something that you have maybe your past fuel data and maybe don't have the resources to go back and do it for a three-year period or, or go back and, and you know, take a look at it, or even going forward, we, we actually do that on a percentage basis um, where we can take your fuel reports, uh, prepare everything for the return. We'll send you the documentation that you can then sign and send off to the state for your return. And the way, like I said, the way we bill that is on a percentage basis. So it's a percentage of your refund amount. So if you don't get a refund, there's no fee. Uh, if you do, there's going to be a percentage that that uh, you would pay ComData for that service. Thanks, Matt. Um, let me pull up the next question here. Bob, how long do we need to keep source documents for IFTA or IFTA? For IFTA, you need to retain them for up to five years, depending on the fourth year, when that uh, fourth year completes. So ComData does retain that information on behalf of our customer. So the customer does not have to retain that as long as they're a customer of ComData. That is part of the service for ComData. Great. And Bob, let me um, ask you to take this next one, too. Um, I think we touched on it earlier, but I did want to just drive home this point. What EOBR company does ComData currently work with? We have relations with uh, Qualcomm and PeopleNet. Um, we also, if a carrier is utilizing an EOBR company, we will work with that company, if we currently don't have relations, we will work with them to get data out of their system, whether it's like on a, an operating system like TMW or Tom McCloud, whatever. Um, and if that's not possible, which so far we've been able to work with each, each and every one, then we can get the data directly from the carrier. So in either uh, example or scenario, ComData can obtain the data either directly from the OBR or from the carrier. Great, and um, it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, Bob, I'm going to let you field this one as well. Um, how do I get started with ComData Fuel Tax? How long does it take to uh, get rolling after we sign up? The, uh, the process is normally, if everything works well, the customer completes the paperwork in a timely manner, uh, the whole process is about two weeks. Um, it, it, the application gets runs through ComData's credit system service, or excuse me, credit, credit department, and then account number is assigned. The implementation specialist, the customer relations assistant, uh, client advisor will start working with the carrier to identify how we will uh, receive miles and how we will receive fuel, and look at any uh, peculiarities that may be in the process that need to be worked out. So all in all. If everyone is working and, and clicking, it's a two-week process. Great. And again, um, to get the whole thing started, uh, if you're already a ComData customer, you can go ahead and speak to your sales representative. Otherwise, if you're interested in continuing the conversation about ComData's fuel tax or other regulatory compliance solutions, you can enter your name and email address or phone number in the question section of your control panel and someone from Bob and Matt's teams will follow up um, with you shortly. Uh, so this concludes today's presentation. Thank you again so much for joining us today. If you have any further questions, please join our group on LinkedIn, where Matt will be hosting a post-webinar discussion. You can um, just go to LinkedIn and search ComData under Groups, and you'll be able to find us there. You will receive a recording of this webinar in just a few hours, I believe, this afternoon. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today.